this Indo-Pacific tilt would not undermine interests in the Euro-Atlantic area. So can the Minister tell the House exactly how engaging in secret diplomacy against the mutual security and against the trust interests with one of our closest European allies helps our interests in the Euro-Atlantic area? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, I, I, I think that would be a, an accidental mis um, uh, understanding of the situation from the, uh, uh, from the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, the reality is a close friend and a close ally decided they had a different strategic need. They wanted to do something differently. Uh, they approached us, and it would have been uh, very strange not to have engaged in very constructive talks uh, with Australia in those circumstances. That's not being secret or going behind people's backs. That's responding to a request. Yeah. Was, Mr. Speaker, let's not, let's not muddy the words here. Paris was deceived, was it not? And isn't it the case, Mr. Speaker, that common challenges are better faced when Liberal democracies trust each other and we understand each other's mutual interests? Whether it's the rise of authoritarianism, issues with climate change, terrorism, or indeed migration, we must be aligned with Euro Atlantic allies first. So, hasn't the fallout from AUKUS taught us all that what we need to pursue is a comprehensive defence and security treaty with the European Union? Yep. And can he tell us then why was France excluded right from the start? Mr. Speaker, uh, we have got a close relationship. We've got a number of close relationships, including through Five Eyes, which we pursue on a global basis. We have an extremely close relationship with France, with whom we are doing so much around the world and with whom we enjoy extremely close relationships on equipment and sport, but also actively uh, in the field. The bedrock of our relationships inside uh, Western Europe is, of course, NATO, yeah. something which the Honourable Gentleman would, uh, would agree with. It is absolutely vital. That is the absolute cornerstone of our defence and an area where we work so closely with our European allies, including France. Robert Holt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Armed Forces are one of this country's biggest providers of apprenticeships. We have around 21,000 apprentices on programmes at any one time, ranging from engineering and digital to construction and driving, showing, Mr Speaker, that if you join the Armed Forces, you get skills for life. Robert Halton. Um, thank you. I, I thank my uh, honourable friend for all the work that the Ministry of Defence is doing on apprenticeships. Can I just confirm that he will continue, his department will continue to meet the target of 2.3% public sector target for hiring apprentices? And can I ask him also to ensure that any company that gets a procurement contract with the Ministry of Defence has a significant number of apprentices, employs a significant number of apprentices, otherwise they won't get the contract? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to confirm that. Over 90% of recruits are offered an apprenticeship, and I'm pleased to confirm that our recent statistics show that 7.9% of our headcount are, are new apprentice starts, exceeding a government public sector target of 2.3. Uh, but of course, we do have ongoing discussions with the DfE to increase this figure. Chris Law. Mr. Speaker. Uh, with permission, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to answer questions 8 and 16 together. I routinely engage at all levels, both nationally and internationally, in order to tackle the threat of terrorism across the Middle East, North Africa and the wider in region. We continue to work with allies and regional partners to promote a safe and secure Afghanistan and to prevent the terrorist groups from gaining any foothold in the country in the future. Chris Law. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. What assessment has the MOD made in collaboration with the Security and Intelligence Services of the impacts of the cuts to UK bilateral aid in Iraq and Afghanistan? And on the increasing potential for international terrorism. Well, I think what I can say to honourable members is that the uh, reduction in CSS funding, which I suspect is what he's referring to partly, is because uh, the CSS funding to continue would potentially go in the hands of the Taliban. And I think as the uh, fall of Afghanistan was happening, I don't think that would be a wise thing uh, to do uh, for anyone. Uh, but secondly, he should also uh, not rule out the fact that Counterterrorism funding, both for here and abroad, has increased significantly since 2015, well over 30 per cent of funding, both for civilians, such as the police and the intelligence services, but also through uh, special forces and, indeed, uh, the armed forces as well. The direction of travel is increasing, not decreasing. The capability that we are procuring, such as the uh, uh, drones that we have recently signed up to, will give us extra capability that we didn't have all those years ago in 2001. Mr Speaker, can the Secretary of State indicate when an update will be given to the House on the terror threat the UK faces following the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and the attendant heightened potential for terrorism being harboured there? Yeah, yeah. 
the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre set, uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the threat levels for this country. They do that independent of government ministers, uh, and when they are changed, they will make the statement, uh, uh, and then the House will be informed. Uh, as far as a, a bulletin or an update to the House's statement, the Honourable Lady is obviously uh, free to table a, a motion, either in the adjournment debate or indeed uh, through written questions, and we'll be happy to make sure we do that. On top of that, we had the periodical uh, updates in Afghanistan, as you will remember, in the counter Daesh strategy. We will continue to make that uh, from time to time. Dr Julian. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that long-term nation-building from the ground up, is not a feasible option in future, and given that terrorist attack could yet happen again, will he institute a serious review of counter-terrorism strategy, possibly based on pre-positioned forces in regional bases to follow an active containment strategy? My right honourable friend highlights an, uh, an important point, which is when, when there is no partnership on the ground, how do we deal with imminent threat to the United Kingdom? While I can't speak for the whole of government on a review of a CT strategy, uh, first of all, because I think com contest in its many iterations, starting obviously in the last Labour government, is probably a world leading counter terrorism uh, strategy, it is periodically refreshed and always. Uh, that will be done in time to meet the changing situation. What I can tell him is that before even the decline in Afghanistan, I had instigated a work on how we can deal with changes to the environments that we fight terrorism in and what capabilities we will need to do so in the future. Paul Mayner. Uh, thank you. Can the Defence Secretary give the House an update on the work of French and British forces in Mali and the wider Sahel region? Uh, the United Kingdom supports uh, the uh, forces, the French forces, Operation Barkhane in Mali with a, a squadron of Chinook uh, heavy lift helicopters. At the same time, we are also deployed on the UN MINUSMA deployment, some 300 British forces on one of the most dangerous UN deployments, helping uh, nation building and also peacekeeping. We also can uh, talk on intelligence channels uh, around the threats, and we are both concerned about the appearance of the Russian mercenary group Wagner now appearing in many parts of West Africa. Over. Uh, Mr Speaker, since the 28th of August, 7,900 applications have been made to the ARAP scheme, uh, of which 900 have uh, appeared eligible under the MOD's perspective. But I would just say to the Honourable Gentleman that obviously thereafter there are Home Office checks that need to follow. 50 uh, applicants have thus far completed their Home Office checks and will be in the process of being advised on how to proceed. Minister, for that answer, but uh, I have cases of people who work for the uh, Supreme Court in Afghanistan, the government, and also for uh, um, um, members of the armed forces there, and clearly assisted in our operations in Afghanistan. Surely the minister accepts that these people are at severe risk, and surely under Category 1 of Arab, they should qualify, yet they've been refused. Mm. So how many people who clearly qualify under the categories for Arab are being turned down in the figures that he's just given me? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I just uh, gave the Honourable Gentleman the numbers for those that have applied since uh, the 28th of August. Uh, I accept completely that there will be a matter of interpretation, but having looked at a number of cases where we've been invited to review them at ministerial level, uh, I'm satisfied that actually the right judgments are being made. I know that's a disappointment to many members of the House who are working hard to support people who are in Afghanistan and who they consider to be at risk, but it's not possible for us to bring out everybody who's had a connection with the, armed, with the UK armed forces under the ARAP scheme. That's why the terms were set out as tightly as they were. And if the Honourable Gentleman would like me to look at any particular cases, uh, I look forward to uh, having that in writing, and I'll do what I can. Shadow Minister Stephen Morgan. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, there is increasing confusion around the Government's administration of the Arab scheme. In response to a written question, the Minister for the Armed Forces said that 1,194 locally employed staff had been relocated by the end of August. Yet, in a further answer, he suggested that only 850 applications had been processed in the same time frame. This means at least 344 people are unaccounted for. The Prime Minister says it's uh, 311. Can the Minister therefore tell the House, here and now, 
how many applications were received between April and August, how many were accepted, and how many have been left behind? Well, Mr Speaker, I'll write to the Honourable Gentleman with the exact detail he requests. 15,000 people were brought out in the airlift, as I think he knows. I think the numbers that he quotes um, and the discrepancy that he thinks he's found relates to the fact that 311 was the number of people who had been called forward, so they had successfully applied and been cleared by UKVI for travel, but we were unable to get them onto a plane. That is different from the number of people who had applications in process at the time and hadn't been called forward for travel. Um, Mr Speaker, I'm sure that, in fact I know from all of my engagements with colleagues across the House, that they will understand that those two and a half weeks in Kabul were somewhat hectic. It will take some time for the dust to settle on exactly who is out, who we have yet to bring out, but we are still working very hard to do so. Security situation is dynamic. Our partnerships in the region are being developed, but we have every confidence we'll be able to help those that need help. Number 10, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The final contract for the manufacturer of the fleet solid support ships will be awarded to a UK business either solely or as part of a consortium. We've been clear that a significant proportion of the build work will be carried out in the UK. Gavin Jones. Uh, Mr Speaker, in uh, spring of this year, the Ministry of Defence uh, invited international companies to collaborate with UK firms to, uh, to build the FSS contract. And this, earlier this year, they awarded a, a £5 million design contract uh, for the project. Now, I've tried in numerous questions to the Minister to try and get the answers to these questions. And I've got to say to him, his answers should be getting creative uh, writing awards for their uh, ways of avoiding answering questions. So can I ask him a direct question? Is in terms of design contracts, who are the design contracts with? Are they with the consortium or the individual companies uh, in the contract? And secondly, can he confirm the prime contractor, the Windsor, uh, Windsor's contract, will be UK, will be a UK company? Yes. Mm. Um, the, we are engaged with uh, the uh, consortium as a whole. Um, the finer points of where exactly the contract lies within that consortium um, I would have to check on uh, for the right honourable gentleman, but the, um, the, the, it is a consortium that is being appointed to conduct the, uh, design, uh, the design work, um, and the, it is a consortium we expect to do that work. It is then the consortium that we will be turning to uh, for the next stage, and as, as the right honourable gentleman knows, there are four, uh, uh, there are, there are, uh, four uh, awards that have been made. Um, and they are for £5 million each from memory, and they go to, uh, uh, to each of those consortium, all of which have got a UK component, um, which will then be uh, presenting not only their design, but their views on to the next stage, onto the build programme. But I'll come back on the precise point that the Right Honourable Gentleman makes. It's a, it's a fair question. I think it's a bit rich from the party opposite to be nitpicking on this contract when the competition which they were calling for uh, for sh shipyards in the UK to be required to be build the fleet solid support ship is precisely what the Minister uh, has engineered. Could he just say and confirm to the House that following last week's outstanding exhibition at DSCI in Docklands where, as he's already referred to, there were further uh, contracts for British shipbuilders, for the announcement of the establishment of the National Shipbuilding off and the AUKUS announcement, the opportunities for defence shipbuilding in this country have never been greater. I, I thank my right honourable friend. I was so flattered to be awarded the Creative Writing Award by the right honourable gentleman. I was perhaps too kind. There is an awful lot which is great going on in British shipbuilding at the moment. Uh, the, he's been calling for the design contracts to be awarded. They've been awarded. We're getting on with FSS. And there is great news, as my right honourable gentleman uh, says, regarding, right honourable friend suggests, regarding Type 31 as well. So a lot of good news in the sector. Dame Johnson. Number 11, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With permission, Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I would like to answer questions 11 19 together. Defence medical services provide a responsive and comprehensive treatment service for personnel requiring medical intervention. We have improved access to mental health care and given armed forces personnel greater choice with the introduction of new ways of working, including digital triage and remote video consulting. Dame Diane Lynch. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Armed Forces Covenant, as the Minister knows, states that those injured in service, whether physically or mentally, should be cared for in a way that reflects the nation's moral obligations to them. But the Government has actually missed targets on all mental health care for veterans across all services in England. And unless this changes, doesn't this risk rendering the Covenant, which I know the Government wants to strengthen, uh, 
meaningless. And actually, the government need to get their act together on mental health services for veterans and the armed forces. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On, on the contrary, we are giving teeth to the armed forces uh, covenant by passing the armed yeah. forces bill, uh, and we will ensure that no veteran, in whatever circumstances, is ever disadvantaged. Gerald Jones. Mr Speaker, charities across the UK, including many who are, have supported veterans, have been hit hard, as we know, during the, the pandemic, impacting on the services that they could provide. So, could I ask that the Minister, what additional support is the government offering charities to be able to cope with demand, and what more can the government itself do to support veterans, given that their record so far is pretty poor? Well, on the contrary, Mr Speaker, we're putting an additional £3 million into Op Courage, making that 20, more than £20 million this year and an additional uh, £5 million into Armed Forces Charity, which means that more than £25 million will go to Armed Forces Charities this year. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I think that, sh that, that shows that the government is putting its money where it's not. Obviously. 13, please, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week was a good week for defence jobs. Yeah. I announced investments in laser and radio, and radio frequency weapons, which will sustain... Sir, you grouping. I do apologise, Mr Speaker. I omitted to say, may I take this question with question number 15 and question number 20 with your permission, sir? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And now, if I may respond to the question. Last week was a very good week for defence jobs. I announced investments in laser and radio frequency weapons, which will sustain 249 jobs and create 49 more, including 30 in Northern Ireland, and investment to enhance the capabilities of C-17 and Chinook, supporting 200 UK jobs and creating 50 at RAF Bryce Norton. And on Friday, my right honourable friend announced a £170 million investment in next generation submarines, supporting 250 jobs at Barrow and 100 jobs at Rolls-Royce Derby. The UK sector more broadly already directly and indirectly supports over 200,000 jobs across the UK. Bob Seeley. Mr Speaker, first I'd like to add my thanks to all the service personnel who are not pitting and pay tribute to the as ever impressive leadership of Brigadier James Martin. Radar is vital to our nation's defence. Royal Navy's radar is made in cows on the Isle of Wight. Does the government have a plan for the development of next generation radar? It absolutely does, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman is an assiduous uh, proponent of the island's defence sector. I visited uh, GK and uh, Aerospace in Cowles uh, in the summer, one of a number of great companies on the island. And on radar, he will be pleased to hear that we are indeed working closely with BAE Systems on potential spiral development of the current maritime radar. Nicola Richards. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituency of West Bromwich East boasts great skills and is only 30 minutes away from Telford's production hub of the British Army's boxer fighting vehicle. What is the Minister going to do to ensure UK SMEs get proper access to contracts and defence supply chains, including our fantastic businesses in the Black Country? I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. MOD equipment and support spent with, spent with SMEs exceeded 21% last year. We are determined to push this higher, and I'll be publishing a revised SME action plan later this year. On Boxer, which the Honourable Lady referred to, over 60% of the contract is expected to benefit UK suppliers. Following the IR, we are considering expanding the purchase, which will create even more opportunities for SMEs, including in the black country. Dr. Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Lincolnshire is rightly proud of its RAF links. The Future Combat Air project will support jobs and bring crucial capability. Can my honourable friend confirm that this is on track with both our international partners and our industries? Mr Speaker, it is absolutely on track. You'll be pleased to hear further progress was made last week with our international partners, Italy and Sweden, with both of whom I've been in discussion over the summer. It's on my agenda for my meeting tomorrow with the Defence Secretary in Japan. On our £2 billion investment in FCAS is benefiting from the co-investment of hundreds of millions of pounds from our industrial partners. John Speller. But of course, jobs in the industry actually depend on contracts. So can I come back to the question posed very directly to the Minister, which he's tried to slide by, about the fleet solid support ships? Why doesn't he give that clear message to industry and to the workforce that actually they will prioritise British jobs and that clearly the design contracts will go to a British firm? Why, does he stop, why doesn't he actually make a proper decision and actually send that message, and also to the steel industry as well. I'm hoping to send a very exact message, and I can reassure the right honourable gentleman 
that, as I've said, uh, that we are, we've made it absolutely clear that that contract will go to a British company solely or part of a consortium. And social value, which we have introduced, uh, will be, uh, and it's very thesis, will be a very significant part of that overall assessment phase. And I look forward to the, uh, uh, the ongoing bit of this competition. He's pushed for it for a very long time. It's ongoing. It is going to happen. And there will be, I'm certain, British companies absolutely embedded throughout that process. Yeah. Shall the Minister Chris Uppens? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> the Minister will know the defence industry has been subject to a spate of takeovers. Many familiar names like Cobham and GKN Aerospace are now in foreign hands, while Megit has been subject to a recent US-based takeover bid. Even though the companies have promised to protect jobs and research and development, it has not stopped them selling assets and closing factories. Workers at GKN Driveline in Erdington and Birmingham are going on strike to protest that there will be 500 redundancies next May. What is the government doing to ensure when British companies are taken over, promises to keep jobs and research and development in this country are kept? Yeah. Um, as the Speaker, as you'll be aware, the uh, legislation we've passed, uh, broadening the scope in which intervention can take place, was cleared through this, uh, through this Parliament and is uh, ready to be uh, introduced. We take very seriously our responsibilities under the Enterprise Act. It's a matter for the Secretary of State at uh, Bayes acting in his uh, particular uh, capacity, uh, but there are guarantees that can be sought and can be uh, enforced as part of that process. Trembledly. Number 14, sir. Yeah, Mr Speaker, the Ministry of Defence conducts a range of operations domestically and overseas, both independently and jointly with allies, including with the United States. We keep our operations and our broader military posture under continuous uh, active review. Edward. Edward. Oh, now, following the debacle in, in Africa and Afghanistan, we know that we can't rely on America. Will the Secretary of State make clear his commitment to our closest ally and traditional ally, namely France, which is absolutely vital for our interests, particularly in regard to migration and many other issues? Will he commit himself to working with the French to improve relations and perhaps involve them in this new relationship in the Pacific? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I listened to my right honourable friend and his points. First of all, the United States and France are our closest allies. The United States is the cornerstone of NATO by far outspending and outcontributing to any other European nation on that security. It has been the guarantor of European security for decades, and we should not uh, forget that. When it comes towards France, I have an extremely close relationship with my French counterpart. I have met her only a, a month or two ago. I had dinner with her in Paris. Uh, even months before that, we speak regularly. Britain and France on many issues are joined at their hip. Complex weapons, counter-terrorism, Africa, both West and East Africa issues, uh, and indeed, uh, more recently, obviously, in places like Iraq and Syria. There is absolutely no intent here by the United Kingdom government to slight, upset or drive a wedge between us and France. Uh, it may be that members would like to listen to the media, but the fundamentals are we have more in common than we have differing us. There was no sneakiness behind the back. It was fundamentally Australia's right to choose a different capability, and it did. Mr Speaker, despite NATO's withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Middle East and wider region remains a major source of threat to the UK. We will continue to engage and invest to keep us all safe. We remain in NATO's training mission in Iraq and fly missions under Operation Shader. Most recently, planes from the RAF conducted a strike against Daesh on the 6th of September. Syria remains a cause of concern, with 900,000 civilians still trapped in Idlib province. It is now the government's view that Turkey's presence is providing stability and averting a catastrophic humanitarian crisis there. That is something the UN representatives have also made clear to me when I visited uh, some months ago. We continue to work to update our defence intelligence assessments and work across government, identifying options to support our NATO ally, Turkey. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm sure you're as pleased as I am with the Operation Warm Welcome. So I'd like to ask the Secretary of State, what warm welcome are we giving to those members of the Afghan Armed Forces and Intelligence Officers who've come to the UK from Afghanistan through Operation Pitting, many of whom have trained in our military establishments such as Santa's and the Royal College of Defence Studies, which I was um, present at last year. And what steps is the Royal, um, my right honourable friend, taking to identify them and integrate them perhaps into our own armed forces? 
Uh, well, first of all, I uh, am grateful to my honourable friend for the question. My uh, uh, colleague, uh, the Minister for Defence, uh, Personnel and Veterans, is absolutely leading the charge here to ensure that, first of all, those people, who, some of whom are arriving to a strange uh, uh, and obviously very confusing outlook from where they have literally taken off one uniform, got on a plane and arrived in the United Kingdom. And we felt it was incredibly important in defence that the veterans community, uh, the local government, uh, home office, etc., reach out a hand of friendship and support them as they uh, integrate into society. We are doing that. We are looking at people who have already qualified, such as going through Sandhurst into the armed forces, to see what we, use we can do. But all the way through, we shall mentor them and put our arm around them. Yeah. We now come to Shadow Secretary of State, John Healy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to ask the Defence Secretary about the Ajax armoured vehicle, the biggest defence procurement failure since the Nimrod. What did the Defence Secretary know about the Ajax flaws when he published the integrated review in his Defence White Paper in March, scrapping Warrior, scaling back Challenger and fully backing Ajax? I knew there was a troubled programme, which I have never... Uh, resolved from at all in this House. In fact, since, uh, as the Honourable Member will know, right Honourable Member will know, since uh, taking off this job, taking over this job, we have been absolutely determined to open up this programme, get to the bottom of its failings, uh, and shortly we will come to the House with more detail on that programme. I felt that this programme, going right back to March 2010, has been a troubled uh, programme that needs to be fixed. Uh, can it be fixed? That is what we are working to make sure we do. But uh, it is nothing to do with linking Wario and the others, which I know the Right Honourable Member is trying to make the case for. Well, Mr Speaker, this isn't just a, another troubled programme or another piece of army kit. His defence white paper confirms Ajax is fundamental to the future of British ground forces. Now, when our NATO allies in Europe already see a Prime Minister with the hots for his in Indo-Pacific tilt, now Ajax alongside the AUKUS Nuclear Propulsion Pact, raised serious concerns over Britain's sustained contribution and commitment to NATO. What's the Secretary of State doing to settle those concerns? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, what the Right Honourable Member has missed off is I also committed and brought forward the buying of Boxer, uh, a, a German, British, Dutch uh, project uh, that will obviously be made in Telford, providing jobs. I also brought forward uh, the Challenger 3 upgrade with BAE Rheinmantel, a German uh, company a lot partnering with a British company to provide jobs. There is a strong, solid, metallic commitment to Europe, uh, and at the same time we press forward with FCAS with Italy and Sweden. My constituents hold the armed services in the highest regard, so there was some serious dismay when the Army Reserve Centre in Chipping Barnet appeared on a list of sites for potential housing development in the emerging local plan. Will the Minister or the Secretary of State give the strongest assurances that the TA Centre will stay in operational use for the foreseeable future? Minister. Mr Speaker, I am very pleased to be able to confirm to the, my right honourable friend uh, that the High Barnet uh, Army Reserve Centre has a continuing defence use and there are currently no plans for its sale. Kirsten Olsen. Mr Speaker, academics at the London School of Economics have concluded that this government's plan to lift the current cap on Trident nuclear weapons based on the Clyde from 180 to 260 are inconsistent with the UK government's obligations mm -hmm. under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Specifically, the 40% increase constitutes a breach of Article 6 of yep. the Treaty. So can I ask the Secretary of State, is international law of no concern to this government? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I would just say that uh, I have it on better authority than those academics that we haven't. Claire Paul the Bell. Use the combination of our EU exit, the Enterprise Act and the new social value rules from HM Treasury to ensure that more British ships are built and with more British content. Yes, I think it's really important that we seek to build more British ships, but we should also recognise there is an international collaboration to shipbuilding. Uh, when I signed with the Indonesian Defence Minister recently the deal uh, to buy the design of the Arrowhead Type 31, we should also reflect that that design originated in Denmark, but the intellectual property was shared with us so that we now profit from that sale and British jobs will sail. International collaboration is important, unlocking investment, which is why we're now going to indicate the longest shipping pipeline uh, uh, for many decades so that people, British companies can invest knowing that there are ships in the pipeline. Hello, Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Elder Ron raised the serious concerns of the fire service crews that are based at Fastlane and Coolport following outsourcing to Carter who have cut jobs. The Secretary dismissed my concerns out of hand, saying the service nationalised. Will the confirm, does he know, is Capita running the service or not? And if he doesn't know, he needs to get a grip of this. Yeah. Right. The, the Honourable Member should actually have listened to the answer. He was making a point about privatisation, and I was making the point that Aldermaston had just been nationalised by the government, which was the opposite ideological uh, uh, scene that he was trying to infer. Understand. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a veteran, I know of the hard work, dedication and often sacrifice our great armed forces make. There are many of these families in Wolverhampton that live and support um, what the great armed forces do. Will the minister do everything he can to make sure all serving and former service personnel have all the support they and their families need moving forward? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I agree entirely with my honourable friend. Service families at the heart of the defence community. Our assistance to them includes wraparound childcare, which has been currently been piloted, and uh, support to partner employment. Uh, we will shortly bring forward the uh, Armed Forces Family Strategy, which will deliver choice and flexibility to service families, because you must be able to serve your country, Mr Speaker, while also supporting your family. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can ministers tell us what discussions they've had with the Home Office regarding the Commonwealth visa issue for former serving personnel? It's something that's entirely missing from the integrated strategy review, and I'd like to know when this House will get an update. Thursday. We obviously published a consultation on a number of proposals for the uh, visa system around Commonwealth soldiers. We will be publishing a response uh, very, very soon, and he'll get the answers he requires. Gentleman Preston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My honourable friend has already referred to the great economic benefits resulting from the £400 million investment in enhancing our C-17 and Chinook capability. But does he also agree that it will help us to ensure that we can continue to undertake complex operations like the recent withdrawal from Afghanistan, where C-17 transport aircraft played a key role? Just have a word. Absolutely, Mr Speaker. It did play a key role. It was a very valuable asset, uh, alongside others, including uh, A400M. I think that's also got a connection with the uh, Honourable Gentleman's constituency. I visited the Honourable Gentleman's constituency. There are great skills there in the defence sector. I was delighted to make that announcement. I'm delighted to see that investment going into that part of our country. Margaret Farrier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What assessment has the Secretary of State for Defence made of the impact of the introduction of operational MGS employment contracts on levels of staff fatigue and security at UK military bases? Whenever we examine uh, uh, new arrangements for services for our military, we of course examine all the impacts on security, uh, on accountability uh, and indeed performance. Dr. Julian Lewis. Um, will the Secretary of State inform the House what members should do when they are contacted by people who have been of assistance to our armed forces in Afghanistan, but whom they have reason to believe the Taliban are hunting? Is there any help that we will be able to give them, and how should we go about approaching the government to secure that help? Uh, thank the right honourable gentleman for his question. Um, if in the first instance he were to advise them to go to the Arab website and apply to the scheme, but it does no harm at all, as many colleagues have done, to write to me or my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, in parallel, and we're working through those cases at best speed. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, when you have people who are pursuing successful careers in the armed forces, but when sometimes they go back to their old school and say, look, this is what I've done, this is what you can do, this can be a real incentive to recruitment, would the Secretary of State agree with me that this would be a good way for him to coordinate the Secretary of State for Education in the future? So stay. I do think it's an incredibly important way to inspire young people about the careers that are ahead. Uh, I also think when uh, politics don't get in the way of that recruitment, uh, we are much better. I remember being banned from a school in Dundee when I was doing military uh, uh, recruiting, not me personally, uh, because it, ideologically it didn't fit with some narrative. Very good. Girl, my man. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just following on from the honourable gentleman's question about um, those individuals that were working with British military forces in Afghanistan, um, for those who have uh, found that they have been refused under the ARAP scheme, what is going to happen to these individuals? Are they then going to be referred to the Home Office or to FCDO, or are they just now been left in limbo? Minister, um, thank you, honourable lady, for her question. Um, they don't automatically get referred to the Afghan Citizen Resettlement Scheme. Uh, instead, Mr. Speaker, uh, they're invited to apply to that. And in letters from the MOD to colleagues in explaining that people have not been eligible for ARAP, we're providing the details for how to apply to the ACRS. Dave Diana Johnson. Mr. Speaker, is the Secretary of State able to update the House on uh, the renewal of the uh, red? Um, Deb, uh, sorry, the red arrows. Arrows, thank you. <laughs> sorry, the red arrows and the renewal of the Hawk aircraft, which are now uh, quite old. Whether there's plans to actually renew them in the near future? Uh, yeah. so, there's no plans to renew them. Uh, the taking out of service of the Hawk T1's non-red arrows will obviously provide significant amount of spares and support available for the current Red Arrow fleet going forward. There's no plans in the immediate future or even the medium term to currently review the Red Arrows. Point uh, Mr Speaker, in response to my honourable friend... Check some. It is relating to the question we just had. Okay. Uh, earlier, Mr Speaker, in response to my honourable friend, the member for Kilmarnock and Loudoun, uh, the Secretary of State stated that the naval base at both Fasley and Coolport's fire services had been nationalised, yet Capita won the contract last year yep. to provide the fire services for yep. Fasley and Coolport That's naval bases. Would the Secretary of State like to come to the dispatch box, maybe to rectify that anomaly? Yep. Uh, we've got a willing Secretary of State for you. Mr Speaker, I think the best way for you to rectify it is to read Hanside. You'll see very clearly in there that I referred to AWE uh, in that place, and I think you'll see it there in, in black and white. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's on the record, and what I would say is we aren't going to continue the debate. Right, we're now coming to statements. A business statement. Sec Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I will make a statement on the UK gas market. As honourable and right honourable members will be aware, over the weekend I held discussions with Ofgem and energy companies, and this morning I held a further roundtable discussion. Today I will set out the government's approach to manage the impact of high global gas prices affecting the UK and countries across Europe. To begin, I want to make two points extremely clear. Firstly, Mr. Speaker, I must stress that protecting consumers is our number one, our primary focus, yeah, yeah, yeah. and will shape our entire approach to this important issue. Secondly, I also want to reassure the House that while the UK, like other countries in Europe, has been affected by global prices, Britain benefits from having a diverse range of gas supply sources. We have sufficient capacity and more than sufficient capacity to meet demand and we do not expect supply emergencies <coughs> to occur this winter. There is absolutely no question, Mr Speaker, of the lights going out or people being unable to heat their homes. There will be no three-day working weeks or a throwback to the 1970s. Such thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, is alarmist, unhelpful and completely misguided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To begin, I'd like to set out, Mr Speaker, some of the context for the global situation we are now witnessing. As the world comes out of COVID-19 and economies <laughs> reopen, we are seeing a dramatic uptick in global gas demand much faster than many people had anticipated. High demand, Mr Speaker, in Asia for liquefied natural gas 
transported globally by freight means that far less LNG has reached Europe. Weather events uh, in the US have also affected LNG exports to Europe. So therefore, increased demand coupled with reduced uh, variety of uh, supply globally has put upward pressure on the price of gas which is traded globally. High wholesale gas prices have subsequently driven an increase in wholesale power prices with a number of short-term markets trading at or near record levels. While we are not complacent, we do not expect supply emergencies this winter. This is a very important point. This is not a question of security of supply. The GB, the Great British uh, UK gas system, has delivered securely to date and is expected to continue to function effectively with a diverse range of supply sources and sufficient delivery ca capacity to more than meet the demand. The National Grid electricity system operator has the tools uh, within itself to, to operate the electricity system reliably, to balance that system, and we remain confident that electricity security can be maintained under a very wide range of scenarios. We aren't reliant on any one particular source uh, for our gas, like many of our uh, country, our friends uh, in Europe. Domestic production, as uh, members and right honourable members should know, is our largest single gas supply source and accounted for about 50% of total supply last year. However, the UK also benefits from an excellent relationship with Norway, one of our most important and reliable energy partners, and that delivers nearly 30% of our total gas supply. Just in the last half hour, Mr Speaker, I was uh, privileged enough to speak to the Norwegian Energy Minister and to welcome the announcement uh, from Equinor today that gas production will significantly increase from the 1st of October this year to support the UK and European yeah, demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our remaining supply, Mr Speaker, is sourced from global markets via two interconnectors uh, to the continent and also uh, through the LNG, uh, our LNG infrastructure, which is, as many of you know, uh, as many members know, is the largest in Europe. Obviously, the global gas situation has had an impact on some of our energy suppliers. We've already seen four suppliers exit the market in recent weeks, and we may well expect to see further companies exiting the market over the coming weeks. I have to say, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, at this point, that having been Energy Minister for nearly two years before I became Secretary of State, uh, we saw in those two years, uh, at around this time, companies exiting the market. It may well be more uh, this year, but this is something which at this time of year, ahead of the Renewable Obligation uh, Certificate Payment, uh, this is something which is often seen in the market. I want to make it very clear today, however, that uh, this is not unusual. It is not unusual for smaller energy suppliers to exit the market, particularly, I may add, when wholesale global prices are rising. The sector has seen, as I've said, regular entry and exit over the last five to 10 years, and that is indeed a feature of a highly competitive market. The current global situation, as I've said, Mr. Speaker, may see more suppliers than usual exiting the market, but this is not something which uh, should be any cause for alarm or panic. We have clear processes in place to make sure that all customers are supplied with energy. When an energy uh, supplier typically fails, Mr Speaker, Ofgem appoints another supplier to take on serving the customers and there is no interruption to supply. I reiterate, our first and primary consideration is for the customer. I'd like to stress three further principles which are guiding my and the government's uh, approach in this matter. Firstly, the government will not be bailing out uh, failed companies. There will be no rewards for failure or mismanagement. The taxpayer should not be expected to prop up companies which have poor 
uh, business models yeah, yeah. and are not resilient to fluctuations in price. Secondly, customers, especially, most particularly, uh, vulnerable customers, must be protected from yeah, yeah. price yeah, yeah, yeah. spikes. And thirdly, Mr Speaker, we must ensure that the energy market does not pay the price for the poor practices of a minority of companies and that the market still maintains the competition, which is a feature of today's uh, current system. We must not simply return to, I quote, uh, the cosy oligopoly of years past, where a few large suppliers simply dictated to customers uh, conditions and pricing. I'd like to reassure uh, all members and honourable members' constituents that the energy price cap, which saves 15 million households up to £100 a year, is staying. It's not going anywhere. As I said earlier, our priority in this situation has to be the consumer, the great British public. And the cap uh, has done that effectively. It protects and has protected millions of customers from sudden increases in global prices this winter. We are committed to that price cap and it will remain in place. Meanwhile, sir, our warm home discount, winter fuel payments and cold weather payments will continue to support millions of vulnerable and low income households with their energy bills. It is absolutely vital that the energy supply sector remains a liberalised, competitive market in order to deliver value and good service to consumers. As a result of high global gas prices, uh, members and right honourable members will have read, perhaps, that two fertiliser plants uh, shut down in Teesside and Cheshire last week. They suspended the production of CO2 and ammonia, a decision which has surely uh, 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 has affected in the short term our domestic supply of carbon dioxide, which, as everybody knows, is used in the food and drink, uh, and as well as the nuclear and health sectors. Yesterday, I met Tony Will, the Global Chief Executive of CF Industries. We discussed the pressures the business is facing, and we have explored quite thoroughly possible ways to secure vital supplies. Work is ongoing across departments in Whitehall, across the government, to ensure that those sectors which are impacted, which are affected by this announcement, have appropriate contingency plans in place to ensure that there is indeed minimal disruption. To maintain our domestic supplies of CO2, we are in constant contact with relevant companies who produce and supply CO2, and we are monitoring the situation minute by minute. Over the past few days, as has been widely reported, I have held several discussions with chief executives of the UK's largest en energy suppliers and operators, and also with Ofgem to discuss this vital issue. Just this morning, I chaired a roundtable with UK energy companies and the representatives of consumer groups in which I reiterated, as I have done on the floor of this House, the need for all of us in government and across the industry to prioritise, to prioritise uh, customers, in short, to protect the consumer. Meetings are continuing across government today and throughout the course of this week. In terms of further actions and statements, Mr Speaker, this afternoon, shortly after the statement uh, presented here, I will be making a joint statement with Ofgem, setting out the government's next steps following uh, healthy and, and, and uh, illuminating, in many cases, discussions with them and suppliers. Mr Speaker, our security of gas, gas supply is robust, but it is the case that the UK is still too reliant on fossil fuels. Our exposure to volatile global gas prices underscores the importance of our plan to build a strong homegrown renewable energy sector to strengthen our energy security into the future. Thanks to the steps that we have made as a government, renewable energy sources have quadrupled 
in terms of gigawatts of capacity uh, since uh, 2010, far more than quadrupled, in fact. But there is still clearly a lot more we can do in this area. That is why we have committed to approve at least one large-scale new nuclear project in the next few years and are backing the next generation of advanced nuclear technology with £385 million helping to attract billions of pounds in private capital and create tens of thousands of jobs. Consumers come first, to conclude, Mr Speaker, and we must protect our constituents. Yeah. Before anybody bothers, it is totally unacceptable to spend so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've not warned the opposition. The fact that you've taken almost 13 minutes, I would have thought the people that put this together would time this out. It is 10 minutes for a statement. We need to get back into the rules of the House, not the rules that I make, the rules that this House makes. So what I'm going to say to the opposition is, I'm sorry you didn't know it was going to take so long, but by all means you can more than have an extra minute or whatever to try and compensate for this. But please, in future, we do get it right. We shouldn't take advantage of the members here who are here to question the Secretary of State. Sir Secretary of State, Ed Miliband. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Secretary of State for his uh, statement? And can I first of all say that he, he is right, and I agree with him, that we should not be alarmist on the issue of security of supply. But I do fear his statement was much too complacent on the price and economic impacts of the current situation. For, first, let me ask him about the continuity of supply issue. We support him taking all necessary measures to ensure that families and businesses continue to have access to energy and we secure the issue of CO2 supplies. Now, he says, Mr Speaker, there are mechanisms in place to ensure that customers of failing companies get taken on. But I do say to him that the scale of problems in the market will provide an unprecedented test of those mechanisms. So can he tell us whether he believes taxpayer support will be necessary to deal with the problem? And if it is, obviously, we must ensure value for money. I, I welcome his caution about outcomes which lead to taxpayer subsidy for big companies to further concentrate their market share. But can he therefore explain what the alternatives are and what he proposes happens to the customers of suppliers that do not get through this crisis? He's making a statement later on this afternoon. It would be good to know what he's going to say. Second, Mr Speaker, on the impact of price rises on business, businesses and industry, can he set out his plans to support businesses, particularly energy-intensive industries? Has he considered with his colleagues the provision of government support, including possibly loans, to help businesses facing difficulties? On consumer support, he is right to keep the price, price cap in place. It's a measure, Mr Speaker, I have long supported. But the rise in the price cap of £139 means half a million more families will be plunged into fuel poverty. Now, at a minimum, he should be looking at making the operation of the £140 warm homes discount automatic and possibly extending it. But even that will not be enough, Mr Speaker. Families are facing a triple whammy. Rising energy prices, national insurance rises, and at the end of this month, the £1,000 cut in universal credit. Mr Speaker, these energy price rises turn the indefensible decision on universal credit into an unconscionable one. If he really wants to put consumers first, if he really wants to help working people, if he really wants to tackle fuel poverty, isn't it time, even at this late stage, stage to cancel this terrible decision on universal credit? Third, we need to learn, learn longer-term lessons from this crisis about the resilience of our energy system and the lack of resilience, which has contributed to very large price spikes. Now, there are global issues about, on this. He's right about that. But the UK is facing particular difficulties. Let me give you, him some examples of government decision-making. In 2017, the gas storage facility, Rough, then 75% of our storage was planned for closure. The government could have acted to keep it open, but did nothing. Our lack of gas storage was raised by industry, the GMB union, and by the chair of the Bay Select Committee in 2019, my honourable friend, the member for Leeds West. The minister said in reply to her, the UK's gas system is secure and well-placed to respond effectively to unexpected changes in supply and demand. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, wasn't the government then as now far too complacent on the issue of gas storage? Next, energy efficiency. Now, this could significantly cut the demand for gas, but we've had the fiasco of the Green Deal, followed by the fiasco of the Green Homes Grant, and then the delayed heat and building strategy. And actually, Mr Speaker, emissions from buildings are today higher than they were in 2015. When is he going to have a proper retrofit plan? On new nuclear, 
the, the program is, you might say, stalled. And while we've made progress on renewables, and he is right about that, the truth is we need to go further and faster with a more diverse supply. Above all, Mr. Speaker, there is just not yet enough of a clear plan from government for how we meet net zero with affordability and security. He will have read the Climate Change Committee's progress report uh, this, uh, this summer, where they said it is hard to discern any comprehensive strategy. Isn't the truth that there's a direct line from del delay, dither, and failure to the issues we face today? Now, in the midst of this crisis, can I urge him, therefore, to use this autumn's net zero strategy, delayed, net zero review, delayed, and the comprehensive spending review to finally put in place a proper plan. Households, businesses and energy supp suppliers are looking to the government for support and direction as we face this crisis. It requires not words, but action and delivery. And Mr Speaker, it is long past time for government to get a grip. Secretary of State. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'd like to apologise for the lengthy statement uh, that I issued just a few moments ago. I'd like to address a couple of the points that the Right Honourable Gentleman made. He talks about a plan. I mean, we've got um, plans and strategies galore. We have the Energy White Paper, which was widely received, and I was very happy uh, to, to present that as Energy Minister. We also have the Prime Minister's 10-point uh, plan. And I was very struck by the fact that when um, John Kerry, uh, former Secretary of State Kerry, uh, came uh, to the UK, he publicly said that the UK's plans for decarbonisation were more advanced than any other country. In terms of, uh, I think, his very legitimate concern about vulnerable customers, uh, I have made it very clear to industry and also to Ofgem that uh, vulnerable customers are absolutely our number one priority. We are looking at the uh, warm home uh, discount. We've always, as a government, uh, focused on protecting the vulnerable and uh, people in fuel poverty, and we will continue to do so. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary, Secretary of State is entirely right. The UK is far better placed than most other European countries when it comes to the sources and diversity of its gas supplies, not least thanks to the two major liquefied natural gas terminals in my constituency at Milford Haven. So would you join me in paying tribute to the teams working at the South Hook and Dragon LNG terminals, but also make a commitment today to work with myself, the Port Authority and industry on the Haven there to make that transition to the next stage of our energy development and see a new generation of floating offshore wind and other renewable energy sources there. My right honourable right friend will be well aware there is a commitment to floating offshore wind uh, in the Energy White Paper and the 10-point plan. We have explicitly set a one gigawatt target for 2030. I fully expect and hope that that is exceeded. And I'm also very, very um, pleased uh, to be able to tell him that I'll be uh, very keenly focused on Dragon LNG. I haven't visited it yet in my two years as Energy Minister and Secretary of State, but I'd be very happy to uh, accede to his invitation. SNP spokesperson Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State almost brought himself to say it, but decades of underinvestment in renewable technologies, the barriers put in place by Brexit, 11 years of Tory austerity, a national insurance tax hike, the plan to rob £20 per week from those claiming universal credit, food prices rising, shelves emptying, and now this energy consumers facing skyrocketing, eye-watering bills. Let's call this what it is, Mr Speaker. This is a cost of living crisis, and it's one created on the watch of this UK yeah. government. So what now? What's the plan? Well, I don't, with all due respect, think that the warm words of the Secretary of State quite cut it. He mentioned the energy price cap, but what he failed to acknowledge was the fact that in just a matter of weeks, the energy price cap will be at its highest level ever. So will he therefore back new financial support for those in the lowest income households? And will he of course call on the Chancellor to scrap the cut to universal credit? He did acknowledge, of course, that it's not just households who are being hammered by this rise in gas prices, it's also businesses, in particular those who produce and transport goods. 
but he didn't say what specific support he intends to provide to those businesses. On renewables, one of the key solutions to our supply issues lie not in nuclear, of course not in nuclear, but in the Scottish Munros with hydro pumped yeah. storage. So can I ask the Secretary of State, when will he finally introduce a mechanism to make yeah. that technology really come to the fore? Yeah, and just yeah. finally, Mr Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to ask the Secretary of State at this moment in time, what message would he have for the likes of the Prime Minister, who of course told us in 2016 that if we vote to leave the European Union, then energy bills will be reduced? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, I find it extraordinary that the Honourable Gentleman is still relitigating the so-called Brexit uh, 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 wars. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, this is a serious issue, and it's not a time to yeah, yeah. refight the battles of five years ago. In respect of the, in respect of the comments that he made, I am fully uh, conscious of the outstanding contribution that hydroelectric power uh, plays. In fact, I was just speaking to the Norwegian minister. And that country has 96% of its electricity uh, deriving from hydropower. The geography of our own country means that we cannot uh, reach to that level, but that's something which I've absolutely asked officials to look into. And he will know, given my record, both as Energy Minister and as Secretary of State, that I'm a very uh, keen supporter of renewable energy. And as I've always said, and I said to the Right Honourable Gentleman opposite, uh, the uh, safety, the, the consideration, the, uh, the focus on protecting vulnerable customers in the case of this government is absolute. And Jill Lentz. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend is absolutely right to reassure consumers that energy security in the UK is safe. But does he agree with me that we need to urgently move towards far greater, as we transition away from fossil fuels towards renewables, electricity market reform. So what we urgently need is an independent system operator, and we need much more local generation and local energy pricing yeah. to encourage consumers to use plentiful wind and solar energy when they are generating for their optional um, energy use. I'd like to thank uh, my right honourable friend very much, and of course remind the House that when I was appointed as Energy Minister, she, in fact, uh, was the Secretary of State in the Department and really pushed a great deal of reform and innovation uh, in this area. I'd like to reassure her that conversations about an independent system operator and how we can actually uh, modernise uh, uh, the way we balance the electricity system are happening all the time, and I'd be very o open to hearing her suggestions about how we can, uh, we can bring that about. I think that energy security in this country, thanks uh, in part to her efforts, uh, when she held the post I currently do, um, are, are good. We have a diversity of supply. Uh, we've considered uh, a wide range of renewables. And in fact, we are pioneering and leading the world uh, in the development of renewable technology. Darren Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm grateful to the Secretary of State for advance copy of his statement. Uh, there are, of course, a whole range of important questions here to be answered to ensure that we don't face similar energy crises in the future. Uh, and my committee will be asking ministers to answer those questions over the coming days and weeks. But can I ask the Secretary of State a specific question today? Can he guarantee that the warm homes discount rebate will continue to be paid to consumers who are forced to change energy supplier? Yeah. Yeah. So State. Uh, I know you, uh, he is tempting me on dangerous ground, but of course uh, any guarantee of that kind has a fiscal implication, which uh, he will no doubt be aware um, is also a matter for, for Treasury as well. So we're in constant discussion about that. I look forward to seeing him uh, in the, his usual place in the committee on Wednesday. I know that he takes these matters very seriously, and I'm sure we will have fuller discussion of these subjects uh, then. So John Bradford. Uh, will the Secretary of State talk to the industry urgently about having more uh, gas storage capacity? We have tiny capacity compared with most advanced countries, and it would provide a buffer to smooth supplies and keep prices down if this turns out, as we hope it will be, to be a short-term interruption to supply from Russia and America. So I, I think the Right Honourable Gentleman, with his uh, characteristic acuity, uh, hits the nail on the head. Um, gas storage is definitely an issue, but actually the, 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 fact, that, uh, the fact that he, adver he pointed out is that we don't know how long this uh, spike in the gas price lasts. We mustn't 
uh, precipitate a rush or, or through any alarmism uh, instigate panic. There's no cause for that at all. Um, but clearly this is a situation that needs to be reviewed. I'm very happy uh, to speak to him about uh, particular solutions. I know he's got various views on interconnectors and I look forward to discussing with him very frankly about the way ahead. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Further to that question, the Honourable Gentleman referred to our uh, tiny capacity. The UK cut its strategic gas storage to 1.7% of annual demand when a former government adviser suggested it should be closer to 25%. In light of this, why did the government allow for the rough storage facility off the Yorkshire coast to close without taking action? As, as I've said repeatedly from this dispatch box today, we do have a wide source of energy supply. We have the, by far the largest offshore wind capacity in the world. There's no reason why we should be uh, inducing panic because of uh, the closure of gas storage facilities. It's something that I said we should look at, but I don't think it's, it's, it's right uh, for honourable members and right honourable members to stoke alarm yeah. uh, simply by focusing on questions that aren't really relevant uh, to today's debate. Alan Kearns. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I declare interest as the Chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on, uh, on Energy Security. Can I pay tribute to the Secretary of State for uh, the action he's taken to protect consumers and to calm the concerns that, uh, uh, that some commentators and some uh, uh, members here uh, have expressed? But does my right honourable friend agree that diversity is the key phrase to uh, reduce the long-term risk of, uh, of such volatility uh, in the markets? That's diversity of supply. Diversity in energy generation, be that wind, nuclear, uh, biomass, uh, hydro or other sources, but also diversity in location, in, that some where, in where the energy is uh, generated. Uh, some nations, regions and even countries have an excess supply on some occasions and a shortfall on others. The greater the diversity, the less the risk. And uh, is he sufficiently uh, reassured that Ofgem have, are sufficiently proactive in this field? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. He spoke about three distinct uh, categories, and I, and I can assure him that on all three uh, we have a degree of robustness. In terms of the uh, spread of the gas supply, I've said that we have a, a wide range of sources uh, for gas. In terms of electricity generation, I can reassure him that our work with renewables, we brought uh, uh, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar. Uh, there's a, a much wider range of uh, energy supply, uh, electricity generation uh, uh, supply, in the UK than in practically any uh, other country. And in terms of geographical spread, he will notice that a lot of these installations, a lot of this capacity, is spread very evenly across the United Kingdom. And I happen to know that because I spent a lot, large part of the last two years visiting those sites. Justin Mathers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. CF Fertilisers, uh, based in my constituency, is one of the plants that has had to close down in light of these...